Thanks for joining us on Tandem Radio for a very special segment by design, focused on helping you understand how God designed you so that you may be healthy and productive in fulfilling God's purposes in your life for many years to come. Now let's join our host, health expert and public speaker, Dr. James Prudian. Welcome to the By Design Radio Program. My name is Dr. James Prudian of Prudian Healthcare and PrudianHealthcare.com, where health literacy is the key to longevity. And as long as God has us on this side of eternity, my show is designed uh, to educate you and your families to feel better, function better, and live as many quality disease-free years as possible. Hope everyone had a great week. And we are going into week number 37 today. And our 37th show is going to be a topic show, not a foundational show. Uh, Last week, I hope everybody enjoyed my article that I shared with you from Dr. Mark Hyman. If you'd like to go back to shows 1 through 36, please go to tandemradio.com, click on the By Design uh, tab, and you'll see archived shows. And then you could see and watch uh, all 37 shows. Uh, all 36 shows prior to today. We are on a mission this year. I'm planning on doing my first year of all of my foundational subject matters. And I'm going to be getting to structural health shortly, being a sports chiropractor and someone who is trained in uh, the treatment and rehabilitation of neuromusculoskeletal injuries. We're going to be spending some time in structure and the structure of our body. And we're also going to be doing some work with structure of our cells. And then we're going to conclude the final foundation, which is fatigue um, in upcoming weeks. But every now and then, I like to take some articles off my desk and and stay topical. And um, this uh, May 18th of 2013, I'm going to be sharing with you something today that really ties into last week's Dr. Hyman article on how we, us Americans, man, have created a healthcare system that's really focused on sick care because sick care is where the money is. Prevention is not. So we'd rather, our system is really based today on the focus is on sick care rather than health care. And I went through that article with you, kind of illuminate, opening some doors, if you will, with respect to the fact that our system is broken because As doctors, most doctors are not thinking about the system as a whole. We're still very fragmented in our thinking, looking at a pill for every ill, and looking at it from a perspective of one system at a time, as opposed to looking at it from a functional medicine perspective. And I shared with you, functionalmedicine.org is a great resource for you guys to go to and learn about functional medicine and to look for functional medicine doctors in your area who are connecting the dots between toxification, digestion, immune system, energy, stress, structure, bringing all of the components together that we're talking about, including epigenetics, which is not allowing our genes to express themselves in, in terms of disease. And we have the control of that. So I recently blogged about this at drprudian.com, speaking about epigenetics and how we greatly impact the expression of our genes through our lifestyle. And the research coming out on epigenetics right now is really overwhelming. The fact that we're born with this genetic code doesn't necessarily predispose us to, to disease. Our lifestyle, our stress level, what type of foods we're eating has that predisposition. So please feel free to read um, at my blog site on epigenetics, and I've even uh, spoken about it in some of the previous shows. So today we're going to start off with this New York Times article that came out May of 2013, the health of the health toll of immigration. I thought it was really a remarkable piece written about what the American way is doing to our immigrants. Uh, first, let's uh, just do our Bible verse, uh, Luke 1, for with God, nothing is impossible. And I believe that most of the chronic illness that is plaguing America and the world today is treatable and reversible. So with God's help and better literacy in the subject matter um, and the truth Truth, which is what we talked about last week, being a big Superman fan, truth, justice in the American way, the truth of this this subject 
is so overwhelming at this point that we have to accept the truth. And it's just like I'm sure back in Columbus's day when he said the earth was round, people went crazy because they couldn't accept that fact. Sometimes the truth hurts or, you know, you can't handle the truth as said in, in, in A Few Good Men. And I, I truly believe that some of the truth that I, I share on a week to week is just so hard for our political leaders and our government to comprehend that it's happening. So the health toll on immigration, let's take a look at what our country is doing to our immigrants. A growing body of mortality research on immigrants has shown that the longer they live in this country, the worse their rates for heart disease, blood pressure, and diabetes. And while their American-born children may have more money, they tend to live shorter lives than their parents. The pattern goes against any notion that moving to America improves every aspect of life. It also demonstrates that, at least in terms of health, worries about assimilation for the country's 11 million illegal immigrants is mistaken. In fact, it's happening all too quickly. So why does life in, a, in the United States, despite its sophisticated healthcare system and high per capita wages, lead to worse health? New research is showing that the immigrant advantage wears off with the adoption of American behavior, such as smoking, drinking, high-calorie diets, and sedentary lifestyles. Welcome to America. For the recently arrived, the quantity and accessibility of food speaks to the boundless promise of the United States. States. Esther Angles remembers being amazed at the size of the hamburgers, as big as dinner plates when she first came to the United States from Mexico 15 years ago. I thought this is really a country of opportunity, she said. Look at the size of the food. Fast food fare not only tasted good, but was also a sign of success, a family treat that new earnings Put in reach. The crispiness was delicious, said Juan Munez, 62, recalling his first visit to Church's Chicken with his family in the late 1970s. I was proud and excited to eat out, I'd tell them. Let's go eat. We could afford it now. For others, supersized deals appealed. You work so hard, you want to use your money in a smart way, said Aris Ramirez, a community health worker in Brownsville, explaining the thinking. So when you hear twice the fries for an extra 40 Nine cents, people think, wow, that's economical. For Ms. Angles, the excitement of big food eventually wore off, and the frantic pace of the modern American workplace took over. She found herself eating hamburgers more because they were convenient, and she was busy in her 78-hour-a-week job as a housekeeper. What is more, she lost control over her daughter's diet. As a single mother, she was rarely with her at meals time. Is that God's design? I just threw that in. Let's continue. Robert Valdez, a professor of family and community medicine and economics at the University of New Mexico, said, All the things we tell people to do from a clinical perspective today, such as eat a lot of fiber and less meat, were exactly the lifestyle habits that immigrants we're normally keeping. I'm going to stop there for a second because that man just said something near and dear to my heart. We all come from other places. I'm a second generation Armenian, for instance. My family came here in the 19, early 1920s from the Armenian genocide. So I have a uh, history. I, my grandmother would tell stories and my mother cooked meals that were made, uh, designed for me from an Armenian background. We all come from different places. Generally, across the board, those meals, we were poor. They were rich in fiber, low in meat, right? They were not processed because most of us were farmers years ago. You know, you lived in, a, in an environment, you traded with the farmer up the street, you grew your own crops. We were generally healthier in the poor uh, in, in the poor countries. So let's continue reading here. I have a little bit more to go. In Mexico, we ate healthily. We didn't even know it, said Ms. Angles, who has developed who has since developed diabetes since she's gotten here. Here, we know the food we eat is bad for us. We feel guilty, but we eat it anyway. That's because it's addictive. Because the people who are a whole lot smarter than we are know that salt, sugar. Poor fats, high fructose corn syrup, hydrogenated corn oil, food additives, and everything that man has designed for our food supply is highly addictive to the brain. Let's get back. Hispanic adults 
are also 14% more likely to be obese, according to 2010 data from the CDC. The rate is even higher for Hispanic children, who are 51% more likely to be obese than non-Hispanic white children. We have a time bomb that's going off, said Mr. Uh, Dr. Ramirez, a professor of epidemiology and biostatistics at the University of Texas. Obesity rates are increasing. Diabetes is exploding. The cultural protection Hispanics had is eroding. That is really an amazing article from New York Times in May 2013. It is showing us that as an exploding population that Hispanics are in our country, what our American-made food, man-made food, and that's why obesity and type 2 diabetes, along with chronic illness, is not a United States problem. It is a global problem because the rest of the world is picking up on our food supply, our stress level, as she said, working a 78-hour work week. You have to, this article, what it, what it meant to me was, as immigrants are coming to our country like my family did many years ago, what did we do? do? What did we do to our food supply, guys? Where did this all happen? So I'm going to go over to an, another article that I pulled out for you guys, written by uh, Cordain, who is um, th has done some really great work um, with, with uh, his writing, C-O-R-D-A-I-N. And what Cordain wrote about in, uh, in one of his uh, blogs, actually, this is a newsletter I get, um, I'm going to read just with what we did with cattle. Since their initial domestication, about 800 breeds of cattle, ha cattle have been developed as specific traits. So, for instance, milk production versus meat, etc. Then these were selected by humans overseeing breeding and reproduction. Throughout most of recorded history, cattle were typically fed by providing themselves free access to pastures, grassland, and, and rangeland. Only in the last 150 to 200 years, guys, what has happened is these animals have have their practices of, of eating have, have changed, substantially changed, because man and its technology has developed. Let me explain. In the early and mid-19th century, uh, such as steam engine, mechanical, railroads, this all allowed for grain harvesting to be efficient and transported both grain and cattle, which in turn spawned the practice of feeding grain it primarily corn, because corn is a grain, to our cattle in something called a feedlot. So prior to this, 1980, uh, 1850 or so, virtually all cattle were range-free. They were pasture-fed. They were typically slaughtered four to five years of age. By about 1885, the science rapidly changed. It was fattening cattle in feedlots, not giving them the ability to walk around much and to exercise and also eat grass. They were eating corn now, which is a which is a grain, and they weren't designed that way. They weren't designed to be eating corn. But anyway, man went and did this and advanced to the point where it was possible to produce a steer ready for slaughter in 24 months. So it went from four to five years to just two years. Now that meat also changed because we were feeding it this grain and this corn. The meat then started to exhibit marbled meat. See, wild animal animals and free-ranging or pasture-fed cattle rarely displayed marbling of its meat. Marbled meat results from excessive uh, fats and, and accumulation of, of, um, of fats inside the muscle fibers. Such meat is typically, typically has increased total saturated fat. It reduces protein and it has a lower proportion of the omega-3 fatty acids, which are the good fatty acids, and higher omega-6 fatty acids, which are the inflammatory fatty acids. So it changed the ratio of God's design of omega-3 versus omega-6. Because cattle was meant to be out in a field eating grass, which is a which is a, a, a basically a non-inflammatory food. So man went and took cattle, instead of slaughtering it from four to five years, slaughtered it in two years because it made it fatter and bigger by 
um, changing its food from grass to corn. So modern feedlot operations um, it, involving as many as 100,000 cattle emerged in the 1950s and have developed to a point where char characteristically the cattle is obese, 30% of its weight is body fat. Now it could be brought to slaughter in 14 months. Technology now allows man to have created this animal, this thing, and now it could be brought to slaughter in just 14 months. Although 99% of all the beef consumed in the United States is now produced from grain-fed cattle, uh, uh, feedlot cattle, virtually no beef was produced in this manner as recently as 200 years ago. Accordingly, cattle meat, which is muscle tissue, was high in total fat, it has lower protein, high absolute saturated fat content, we lowered the omega-3 omega fatty acid content, we increased the omega-6 fatty acid content, we elevated the omega-6 to 3 ratio, and this it represents a recent component of human diets that may adversely influence health and well-being. That, guys, is how man has changed meat. If you go to the supermarket today and you buy meat and you compare it to meat 200 years ago, it might look the same, but biochemically, man has changed the very structure of God's design, increasing um, uh, the omega-6 content, decreasing the omega-3 content, and increasing the fat content by marbling the meat. The case for increasing omega-3s and omega-6 has broad and wide sweeping potential, but characteristically increased the total omega-6 content, which is not good. This is a result of grain feeding. So when we look at grain feeding and the fact that grain feeding increases the inflammation in our meat, we have potential health um, we could potentially improve our health by increasing grass-fed beef. A number of scenarios in, involving improvements in human health can be uh, envisioned by including more and more lean grass-fed beef into the diets of U.S. citizens. These scenarios are dependent upon the specific foods and food groups that would be potentially displaced by grass-fed beef and by the amount of grass-fed beef that would include included in the diet. So the impact, the health Health impact of including grass-fed beef as opposed to the grain-fed kind would be a substantial impact to the health and welfare of all of us. So what that means is when you're out shopping, take a look at slow cooking beef. You want to buy the cheaper cuts of beef. Beef is best uh, uh, is best uh, from a health perspective when it's slow cooked. And the slow cooked grass fed beef is what you should look for in some of your supermarkets that are carrying it now. This chemically or biochemically is the way God designed beef to look like. And please try to eat organic chicken as well. If you eat animal products and you eat chicken, organic chicken is the way to go because chicken is fed a whole lot of bad stuff as well. I don't have time to get into that today. But thank you for joining me and listening to the By Design radio program. If you would like me to send you anything via email, please contact me via prudianhealthcare.com and have a blessed week. And again, thank you for joining me this week. You've been listening to By Design with Dr. James Prudian of Prudian Healthcare. To learn more, visit us at tandemradio.com, that's tandemradio.com, or on Facebook. And don't forget to email us with your questions. We'd love to hear from you. In the meantime, hope you have a healthy week, and we look forward to you joining us next time for more fantastic insights from Dr. James Prudian on By Design, a special production of Tandem Radio.